My name is Whitney Smith. I'm a consultant. I work for Infosys Foundation USA. I'm really happy to be your host today for this session. Um, this session is focused on assessment and specifically looking at, sorry, uh, measuring success. How do we look at assessment and outcomes for CS education? Um, we have a lovely panel today, um, facilitated um, and moderated by Jill Denner. Um, I'm going to uh, do just a quick name and organizational introduction, and then I've been doing introductions, and they're not very good because I'm just reading off of this paper, and I'm finding them to be rather um, unexciting. So I'm going to actually ask them to give a minute or two just about themselves as they start to talk. So um, uh, Jill is with ETR, Education, Training, and Research. Next to Jill, we have Buffy, who's with Helena High School from Montana. Uh, next to her, we have Suchi Grover, who is with uh, Stanford SRI. And at the very, very end, last to be not last but not least, Jennifer Rosado from the College of St. Scholastica. Did I say that correctly? OK, Jill, kick it off. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I just want to say, first off, that I think we are the first all-female panel at Infosys Crossroads. Um, proud to be here with my colleagues. I'm the moderator, which means I'm not going to talk a lot. I'm going to try to draw people out, but I just want to open it with a couple of thoughts. Um, I guess I'm supposed to introduce myself. I'm a social scientist. The nonprofit organization I work at is in Santa Cruz County, about 45 minutes down the road from here. And I study equity and inclusion in STEM fields, particularly a focus on computer science education. Um, I would like this panel to shift the conversation from a discussion about assessment for accountability to looking at assessment for learning. I see assessment not as a scary thing, but as a tool for equity and inclusion. Um, many of us have programs and classes and we say, oh, we know it's working, we know it has an impact, but we also know that we all have biases and blind spots, and I see assessment as a tool for helping us do our job better and overcoming those biases. So. On that note, I'm going to ask my first question, and as part of our question, we've decided that people are going to introduce themselves and say a little bit more about who they are as they answer the question. So our first question is, how do you use assessment in your work? Hi, I'm Buffy Smith, and I've taught for 25 years. I, yay. Uh, eight years English and 17 computer science. Um, I use assessment in my classroom to assess my students to make sure that they're learning what they need to learn. And then I also use it to adjust my curriculum and what I'm teaching. So if I didn't teach something well, then I need to reteach it or teach it a different way. I have this. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, I'm Shuchi Grover. I'm a senior research scientist at SRI International. I'm actually in the Center for Technology and learning, which is a center in the SRI education division. And SRI is a nonprofit about 30 miles south of here in Menlo Park. Uh, I have a background in computer science and the learning sciences. And so, but naturally, I bring it together in my CS ed work, most of which focuses on formal K-12 learning now. Um, so as part of my work as a researcher, I have, I work with assessments in a few different ways. Uh, one is a lot of my work has involved curriculum design, especially in middle school introductory programming. Two projects of mine sort of looked fairly closely at curriculum design. And, and as part of that, I designed assessments to measure um, student outcomes, both cognitive and non-cognitive learning outcomes. So that's one way I use assessments. Another is as part of projects that are solely about assessment design. So at SRI, we have been working especially on uh, developing assessments specifically for the Exploring Computer Science uh, uh, high school curriculum as part of the PACT project. And for that, we use a very principled framework called Evidence Center Design for designing those assessments. Then I use assessments in my evaluation work. So for example, we have we've partnered with San Francisco Unified to sort of help them with their implementation and rollout of CS for All, especially in the middle grades right now. So we use assessments there to sort of get maybe whatever course grain or some kind of, of uh, sense for student learning. Then uh, we also are in conversations with CSTA and, uh, and Infosys, in fact, to sort of see how we might develop assessments for CS learning that could be cross-PD and cross-program. And lastly, 
just a quick word about some emerging assessments that we've been looking at using big data from programming environments to see how we might understand student programming process or how technology enabled environments could be used for um, you know more in an innovative assessment or multimodal data to assess uh, collaboration and you know pair programming and things like that so I'm Jen Rosado from the College of St. Scholastica, which is in Minnesota. I'll just say that right now because probably nobody recognized that. Um, I am one of the project leads for Mobile Computer Science Principles, and then I also work with teachers who go through our um, in-service program to learn about computer science education. So in both of those areas, I work with teachers on helping them think about how assessment can be used in their classroom and to, um, in, you know, like what Buffy was saying about how you can use it to um, keep track of student learning and um, especially as a feedback loop about where you can improve. So um, a little, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, we use um, assessment in the mobile CSP curriculum, both the summative and formative assessments. Summative assessments are driven by the CS principles exam and the performance tasks that are in there. We have a number of formative assessments, including things like self-check exercises and a teacher dashboard to help teachers see where their students are at while they complete um, each of the lessons. And so I think that is, you know, that's a big key for teachers as you go through to be able to see where your students are at. Um, we also use it as part of our program evaluation, but I won't focus on that too much. <laughs> so I'm going to ask each of you to give a, a specific example of an assessment that you've used. Um, what was it designed to measure and how? Okay. So um, I will actually, uh, this is, Ralph is in the room. Ralph is the other mobile CSP uh, project lead, and he's the one who designed these assessments. So each of our lessons in the mobile CSP curriculum includes these self-check exercises at the end of the lesson. Teachers can use them various ways in the classroom. They can have students do them outside of class, inside of class. Um, but what I think is um, unique about them are the Quizly exercises that we have. So instead of just asking students multiple choice questions um, or true-false kinds of questions about their learning from the lesson, they get very small mini programming problems that they can do. So it's much more of an assessment that looks at their ability to accomplish a task and not just understand and know that concept through the multiple choice question. So those Quizly um, programs I think are great small formative assessments that teachers can use to know whether or not students are able to write a procedure, call a procedure, um, you know, put math blocks together to do a calculation kind of thing. So those are the ones that I think are really key um, for our teachers in learning um, where students are at from those lessons. Um, so my example, uh, I think I'll draw from, um, it's a STEM plus C NSF project. We call it VELA because we're focusing on variables, expressions, loops, and abstraction. And as it turned out, um, this, this project sort of grew out of my dissertation work at Stanford, and, and I found through my assessments in that curriculum that students struggle with these concepts more than others. So we sort of focus on these in this particular project. So for this project, we've designed both formative and uh, summative assessments. The formative assessments, we, we, got, uh, we worked with San Francisco Unified Teachers as, as co-designers, and some of the ideas that they gave to us was this idea of an exit ticket. And, and so we've designed formative assessments as part of this curriculum, which we don't give at the end of the class, but at the beginning of the next class to sort of, do, and we call them review questions. And those questions, unlike worksheets and other work that's almost always done in pairs, these are done individually. And I think that's a point that I also want to make, that some assessments should be done individually, even though a lot of CS classroom work <laughs> is done in groups or pairs. And, and so that gives a sense to the teacher for things that they may not have understood. And again, these are small snippets of code that the students may have to answer something on or a quick question where you sort of uh, check to see if they're getting a sense for the concept that you're teaching them. And they're five to seven minutes and, uh, and, and the teacher can review the questions and the responses there and then afterward after she's collected them or take a look at them and, and pick on one or two questions to review with the entire class if she finds that the kids are struggling on a particular problem. And uh, for the summative assessments for, um, uh, in this particular curriculum, we have designed, um, again, a lot of code reading, code snippet kind of, uh, kind of assessments that target 
concepts like variables and expressions which students have problems with. And what we've done is actually also add questions, not just in the context of programming, but in real world phenomena and real world scenarios. How do you see variation? What do you see as being a variable here? How does it change and things like that? So um, those, um, those are two particular examples. And in fact, I should add that in the context of piloting those assessments, we found that even though kids are learning these concepts in programs, uh, programming environments, environments like Scratch, which are supposed to make it easier. The syntax becomes easier, but the semantics of these particular concepts is still a lift for children. And so those are some of the things that get revealed from assessments. Okay. Um, I hope I'm not gonna talk over some of your guys' heads, but since I teach it, I'm going to give a specific example. I teach Python for a semester and then I teach Java for, my kids can take up to four years of computer science at my high school, so I have repeating students. Um, the example I'm gonna give you, I have a new textbook this year, and so it's for my first semester um, students. We learned about instance classes, and so, and it's just the last uh, assessment that I gave, so that's the example I'll use, but um, they had to make an instance class with um, overloaded constructors and get, or, get and set methods. And then they had to um, have a test class that made instances of those. And it was a duck class because my kids love ducks. So I try to bring in things. <laughs> Actually, they keep giving me ducks, so I have a bunch of ducks. So I'm the duck lady. So I bring the ducks in to um, get my kids interested. And um, so they had to make instances of ducks in their test program. My classes are 50 minutes long, and so um, they had to do this in 50 minutes, and oftentimes the kids can't do it in 50 minutes, but I let my kids correct their tests for half credit back onto their tests. So my kids are okay with maybe I didn't get the whole thing done, and then going back and correcting it, and the kids that are really good and really get it, they can get it done in the 50 minutes. And so it's a challenge, and it's kind of fun for my kids. So some of you have touched on the answer to this next question a little bit, but um, it's one thing to collect the data, and it's, it's, you know, it's really impressive all the different ways you're collecting it, but then what do you do with it, right? So can you talk about how you've used the results to make adjustments in your curriculum or your pedagogy or in the assessments themselves? Um, again, I'm going to give a specific example because that's what I do. Um, arrays are a pretty hard concept for kids to get, and... I lose actually, in my old textbook, I got to raise right at semester time, so a lot of my kids would bail at semester be because it was very difficult for them and they wouldn't just stick it out. Um, and so I kept, I've been teaching this for 17 years and I kept trying to teach it and n nothing was working. And so one day I decided, you know what, they like gum, so I got packages of gum and made the gum packages the arrays, and then the pieces of gum were the um, elements of the arrays. And I got cups and Swedish fish and did the same thing with them. And my kids, my upper level kids to this day still wanna know when we're gonna do the gum lesson. I mean, they just loved it. And for the first time, I think they actually understood, you know, the concept of what an array was, so. Um, so, um, I, I could give a couple of examples. One is how we revise assessments. So, uh, we use, in ass assessment design, it's, it's a pretty iterative process of basically designing assessments, piloting them, seeing how they work. And, and that process is actually about assessment refinement. And one of the, one of the things that we often see is the way we've worded our questions. They're, they're not clear kids with reading, reading difficulty find it problematic, Things, questions can be interpreted in multiple ways. So I think any kind of assessment, I think, has to go through this round of, of iteration and piloting and refinement. And in fact, for the VELA curriculum, which is a, a STEM plus C grant and with a focus on CS for all, one of the things that we did in the process of, of piloting is put it through, not put it through, give it to uh, 
an ELL expert for review. And we sort of lowered the readability reading level because we knew that some of our students in middle schools in, in large urban districts sort of are at maybe even third or fourth grade reading level, if not lower sometimes. But to lower the reading level to make it absolutely clear, unambiguous, and, and sort of straightforward, just, just the wording of the questions. Um, in terms of curriculum refinement, I've used it a fair bit. Whenever we've, we've done curriculum design, assessments often point to things that kids are not understanding, which is a problem either with the assessment, which if you know is a good assessment, then it is a problem with the way you taught it. So you refine your pedagogy or, or just the way, the amount of time you give, similar to what Buffy said, you sort of take new approaches. So for, the, for, the, for teaching variables, I mean, the whole point of our current grant is to look at innovative approaches to teach things like variables and expressions, and we've borrowed on ideas from math education. So assessments playing a huge role at all times to sort of give you a sense for curriculum evaluation and um, how to teach things better. So I'll talk to um, maybe my experience actually teaching mobile CSP because I teach that course um, to our undergraduates and our computer science major at um, St. Scholastica. And there's self-check exercises that are at the end of the lessons. That's a great activity to start off class with. Sometimes I use those. Sometimes I use Kahoot quizzes. I don't know if anybody has used Kahoot before. Students love that, especially if you bring cookies for the winter and things like that. <laughs> yeah. So um, those are great activities, like Sushi was saying, to start off in terms of like an exit ticket kind of thing. But you start with, the, start with it at the beginning of the class and see where um, students are struggling. Um, and where you can then make some adjustments. So like when we go through the Kahoot quizzes or the self-check exercises, if you can see that students, like Kahoot especially, you know, only 50% of the students got the question right, okay, well then we need to take a little bit more time here and stop and explain and go through the problem. Um, the other thing that I um, wanna say about these sorts of activities is that they are learning opportunities for students as well as the teacher. And so I hope that um, when we go through those activities and I try to say to students that these little mini sorts of quiz kind of activities are the kinds of things they should be doing to study and learn and not just like reviewing slides and notes, but that they should view these kinds of quiz yourself things as learning opportunities and that's really where like um, better learning happens that sticks longer. So um, the next question is about where do assessments come from, right? So how do you, how do you decide whether to use an existing assessment or, or to create one? And if you, if you want to use existing, where do you find them? Okay. Um, oftentimes, at least at the high school level, if you have a textbook, it will come with software. And I would suggest if you're just trying to, to start a computer science class, and you're nervous about it, you can always generate your first test just using their software. It's probably gonna be multiple choice, true, false um, sort of questions. My tests are programs, so I create my programs and, um, or my tests. And like I said, I generally try to use things that we're doing in the class or that the kids are interested in. Um, so, um there aren't a whole lot of assessments around for 4K12 learners uh, in, an, in an environments like Scratch or Alice. Well, Alice has because Alice comes with a textbook, so it's, it's easy. Um, there, there is work going on in, in other countries, actually. Israel and the UK, they have national curricula and they have assessments. They, in Israel has, has a national exam. And so in my work, I have sort of looked at those and often they're just inspiration for, for you know, creating your own assessments along those lines. So you sort of tailor those kinds of assessments. It's, it's sort of getting ideas for either multiple choice questions or what open-ended responses might be like or what programming prompts might be like. And, and I, I wanna at some point be able to touch on, on different forms of assessment too. You know, it's, it's not just, um, the quick, easy, multiple choice, small, short answer kind of, you know, formative assessment or summative, but also how we might be able to mix um, targeted programming pr exercises in addition to open-ended programs. So um, that's, that's, that's one way we've been creating a lot of our own, which a lot of people have been asking at SRI. We get a lot of requests for 
assessments to you know give to people that are teaching teachers who are teaching in middle or high school um, there are efforts to start aggregating these there are a few platforms out there i know of one called affinity which is aggregating a lot of they 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 are in the math space a lot but they're starting to aggregate i've put my own assessments up there but there are others there are efforts even at sri to sort of uh, create think about platforms uh, of of uh, assessment and CST is also thinking along those lines. So hopefully in some time we will have some good repositories for people to turn to for assessments of, of various kinds, for various levels, tagged by different criteria and things like that. That's just what I was going to say. <laughs> there was, a, the CSTA had a landscape study that came out, was it two years ago maybe now, about assessment and K-12 teachers, um, especially in computer science and thinking about about that and um, uh, that pointed out as well that there isn't you know this great repository of assessment questions that teachers can go to and I would say that in mobile CSP one of the most frequent questions that we get from teachers is where's the test bank where are the set of questions that I can use that I can repurpose for quizzes and exams in my classroom and so that is a real you know need if teachers you know teachers are busy they are so busy and writing a test from scratch is difficult. Writing assessment questions is hard work. And you know, by no means are any of us experts in it, except for maybe Sushi here. So <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and you know, thinking about computer science assessments um, and the types of questions that you can ask and how they differ from how you might have learned about assessment in your education program and how long ago that might have been and what you've forgotten about good assessment, um, what kind of professional developments your school offers around assessment. There's all kinds of issues, I think, with teachers not um, having enough support to write good assessments as well as being provided um, quality assessment banks that they can use themselves. Yeah. yeah. And I just wanted to add that there is an effort going on led by um, Google's CS Education Group. I think Jason Ravitch is leading it up, and they are trying to compile computer science ed and maybe even broader assessments. Some people are nodding assessment approaches. Um, and so yeah. there's pro it's evaluation. Yeah, a lot of evaluation. A lot of evaluation um, instruments. Um, and I also wanted to mention, you mentioned this, Shuchi, in the beginning, the PACT, um, Principled Assessment of Com Computational Thinking. Marie, raise your hand. From SRI is one of the people heading up that effort um, and sp focused specifically on the exploring computer science curriculum, but has broader implications as well. I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of deciding what assessment to use, can you say anything about the cultural or developmental considerations that come into play in choosing an assessment or, or creating? Well, I think one of the one of the challenges is so when you develop an assessment and start and use it, you're using it with a particular student population, and then as you scale it, you know um, you are reaching new populations, and so you know how do you maybe make that first population a good selection so that it um, is not going to fail as you scale, um, and that you're taking that into consideration, but also you know just when I have written say assessments or test questions for um, programming classes, writing things that rely heavily on math knowledge is, you know, like thinking about that, you know, the students in my computer science class really have to know, um, like, greatest common divisor things in order to be able to write a recursive function. Are there other recursive um, functions that I can ask them to write that don't rely on previous math knowledge? Um, so, yes, thinking about those things, and sometimes it just doesn't happen until you see the results and think a little bit more, talk to the students about why that wasn't working for them. Um, so, a couple of things. So, developmentally, um, uh, I think ELL, working with, with ELL experts to, to make sure that readability level is, is um, um, you know, achievable by your student population, especially if they have a very, a, a very wide um, range there. I think using technology is, is, you know, it's a whole untapped space. We haven't yet sort of... We're still in the process of designing simple assessments. They may be pen and paper style or whatever. But as we use technology more, being able to use different modes of reaching students, you know, having a question that can be read out, you know, in an audio way or, you know, different modalities 
uh, or it could be, you know, converted, translated into Spanish or other languages. I mean, I found in my work, in my dissertation work while I was at Stanford, that this is a huge issue when you give the same kind of assessment to an entire class. There are children that are Spanish speaking, may not have, have you know, the kind of level that you're just assuming. So I feel if you have a mechanism to somehow reach students through different modalities, you know, uh, being able to, they could be able to read out or, or at SRI, in fact, some of our online assessments in other spaces, math and science, have these, you know, uh, hotspots or images or, or, or clickable words where they can get the meaning of that word or, 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 sim or a simpler version of the question or things like that. So just thinking about UDL and you know, uni universal design <laughs> for learning and, 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 I, and what they say about UDL is that when you think about, you design it for say children with special needs or, or difficulties of some kind, but it actually serves everybody well because UDL principles are just, you know, designed to sort of reach broader audiences. So that's, um, you know, one consideration. The other for cultural, I would say, I think uh, CS curricula are giving a lot of attention to, you know, student agency, creativity, trying to basically bring, allow students to bring, you know, a little bit of their background into their CS classroom. Open-ended projects is one great way to sort of allow students to sort of connect to, um, you know, their, their backgrounds and their communities and, and sort of bring that into, um, into their projects. So in addition to, you know, structured assessments and, and uh, structured programming assignments, just allowing students to do something that's open-ended and creative that they brings their own cultural aspects into that form of assessment would be, is, is. Um, We don't have a ton of diversity in Montana, so it's mostly male and female, and I've really had to rethink some of what I do be, because traditionally I've had male-dominated classes. And so I'll make assessments about video games or things that are interesting to the males, and I've had to change just even the topics of the assessments to include more of the females. So um, for people who are just starting to think about assessment, I'm wondering if you have advice for them. And this could be about dealing with any resistance you might have to, from students or teachers or parents to implementing assessment, um, or maybe the partners or kinds of expertise you need to have on board to be doing assessment, or it could be something else. What, what advice do you have for people who are just getting started? Um, my advice would be to take it easy on yourself that you're not going to, if you're just starting to do this, you're not going to have the perfect assessment. You're not going to know everything about computer science and you're going to have kids that know more than you do. And be okay with that. I mean, there are some of your biggest assets because they can teach you and teach you know the other kids in your class and stuff. So I would, I know it's very, very hard because we're all professionals and we're very confident in our ability to be okay with not being the 100% know everything. And so I would just say, you know, just give yourself a little room to grow and be okay with not knowing everything. So that, that's a great point, Buffy. I, I think assessments have a bad name and uh, because of the history of assessment and maybe high stakes testing. So I think this, my first message is for, um, I think, uh, the community in general. Let's focus on keeping assessments focused on learning, focused on feedback for curriculum, for the student. It's a normative enterprise. Assessment design always is. You sort of, it's a signal to the student what, what, what constitutes good learning. Assessment sort of signal to the, to the teacher what, uh, what ought to be uh, sort of measured. And, um, and so let's, let's keep it a positive, uh, you know, a, a positive uh, thing around assessment. And the other thing that I want to say for someone starting out is that there are various forms of assessment and I would encourage teachers and curriculum designers to sort of 
keep this, uh, this idea that you should include all kinds of assessment because some disadvantage some learners, like the pen and paper style may, be di may disadvantage some, the open-ended project may you know, sort of serve uh, uh, others who get, are disadvantaged by some forms of assessment. And in addition to just multiple choice or open-ended, there's several innovative ideas coming out. There's Parsons puzzles, and and there's uh, you know drag drop kind of things that they can they can use. They can be completing incomplete projects, you know, programs that you give to them. They could be fixing buggy projects or, or bu buggy programming tasks. So there's various ways of sort of assessing student learning, not just giving them create this program. Here's a blank slate, and. Um, and this idea of, uh, uh, you know, reading code uh, to answer questions is an important one. Code reading is uh, sort of goes hand in hand with code writing skills. It's like reading and writing in general. Um, and, and so you want children to develop abilities for code reading too. So, you know, make sure you have this broad palette, not just open-ended programming tasks, which is a very obvious and a very good way to sort of get kids actually, you know, programming in computer science classes and things like that in programming classes. But there's this whole palette of different kinds of assessments that you could be giving them. In terms of uh, someone from a computer science background and thinking about curriculum development, my biggest advice would be if you are from that area, work with somebody from education or learning sciences. They're the ones who have the expertise in you know, measuring student learning. And so I think a collaboration partnership with them is the best way to go. All right, thank you. So I think we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, as in all the other sessions, I'll ask when you ask your question, please state your name and your affiliation slowly so we can understand. Um, and also say if you want to direct your question to a specific <laughs> panel member or just to anybody who's willing to answer it. And Whitney's got the mic for you. Um, Lynn Diaz from College Board. Um, so in the development of the CSP course and the assessment, I worked on the development of the assessment as well, you know, one of the driving critiques, right, was, well, you know, we have this course and it's supposed to build some excitement. Um, maybe the test should kind of do that as well too. So we integrated the idea of the two performance tasks that we have, right? So um, in thinking about measuring success, we do want to think about measuring student learning, but I'm wondering what your take is on including success um, uh, to include, you know, motivation and interest and, you know, um, the urge or the, just the want to want to continue to know more about, how, you know, whatever, however we're defining computer science. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, you know, the different types of assessments that you're looking at, can they be driving forces also for motivation to continue with STEM and CS studies? No, no, I was going to say, who wants to take that? <laughs> I, I, can, I can take a stab at it, I don't know. Um, assessments in general, I don't know how an assessment could be made motivating, especially if it's a summative exam like the AP exam. Uh, so I think the performance tasks are a great, great, uh, you know, tool that you have incorporated already. I would say maybe just the context of the questions, if you're able to sort of bring in different, uh, you know, CS is everywhere. That's the big message we give our students. So if we can um, situate problems in different you know, areas, disciplines, ways, you know, art or science or math or economics or politics or, you know, whatever, what ha you know, there's so many different, um, you know, ways CS is being used. So if, if, if questions and, and real world phenomena that actually use CS could become vehicles for students' problems and problem solving. Also, my kids, like in a time situation, a lot of the computer science kids don't get to compete because they're not on the athletic teams or... So, in a time situation, it's kind of fun for them and motivating for them to um, see what they can get done in a given amount of time. And I know the AP exam is also timed, so... Yeah. 
So competition is, is motivating. Yeah, I and I, th so. I think another piece of what you were saying, if I understood you correctly, was that shouldn't motivation, not just learning, be a measure of success? And yes. And I absolutely agree. I mean, I think I think that was said in earlier panels. If somebody learned, but they're not motivated to go on and continue learning, you know, we, we that that's a problem. And Jen, we sure. No, I was just going to maybe come back to that. I'm I'm not sure how I would connect motivation to a test that you give students or perform maybe a particular performance task. I mean, we certainly measure motivation as part of our programming e evaluation and you know what are students willing to do and continue on with computer science or how do they view it after they're done with the course. Um, the, the other piece that I would say that maybe is kind of related back to the projects and thinking about those is if uh, in mobile CSP we try to uh, make sure that the projects that students are creating are socially useful so that they have that connection to their community and a sense of doing good, right? It's, improving their community with it, not just that it connects to their own particular interests, but also, you know, doing good in the community. And I think that's a big motivator for students, too. I just want to add that, you know, to the competition and the contest thing, there are other countries have been using, actually, non-programming computational and algorithmic problems as co for contests and competitions. Um, there's one in Australia, the Australia Math Trust, there's Webra. So it doesn't exist much in the US. And I think part of the problem here is that, you know, only the highest performers sort of go on to do the AMT and the AMC and the math contest. If we could reframe that for CS and have something that all kids take that just focus on problem solving and thinking through logical puzzles and things like that, it might be one motivating form of assessment. Hi, so my name's Leanne Delizer. Oh, sorry, I'm from the CS for All Consortium in CSNYC in New York City, and I have kind of a partial answer to Lynn, and then a, I'd love to hear your uh, reflections on it. So uh, to get into the assessment as motivator, uh, Andy Coe from the University of Washington has done some amazing work where he showed that quizzing levels inside of the online learning environment actually promoted students longer engagement in the activity and their desire to come back on their own free time and to continue to engage. So I don't think we should discount as assessment as a motivator because the assessment itself might not motivate, but the feedback that to the student that your time is well spent and you are learning can really drive the continued engagement and that forward motion. And, um, and I think that's something that's really important. It's like, how do we create the feedback loop through our assessments, not only for ourselves about what the students are learning, but for themselves so they can see their progress in the knowledge that they gain over time. And then speaking about interest and motivation, I encourage the room to take a look at the paper that we published last year, this past year at SIGSI called uh, Interested in Class But Not in the Hallway. Interest and motivation actually has a complex cognitive framework. It's not a light switch. And we showed through 1,500 student surveys across five different computer science programs in New York City, a developmental model of student interest development that happens over time from individual situational interest, oh, I'm interested in this thing in this room right now, to long-term sustained individual interest where I'm going to major in that, I'm going to seek out more opportunities to learn. And that division, I think, is something really important for our community to understand as we try and assess motivation uh, and learning as well. Just when you mentioned quizzing levels, I was thinking about the platform that we use as Google's course builder to put our courses up. And in there, each of the lessons and then the self-check exercises we have has this little round dot next to it. And if you haven't attempted it, it's empty. If you've attempted it but got it wrong, it's like half filled. And then if you attempt it and get it right, it's um, completely filled in with blue. And when we had some problems with those like not filling in correctly, you would not believe the number of emails we had from teachers <laughs> about, why can't I get my blue dot all the way filled? I did all of this. Why is my blue, do blue dot not all the way filled? So yes, I think it, it really is interesting what some of those like mini little pieces or like a badging system can do to motivate people. Yeah, I, I think those are, there are some neat ideas out there that we can uh, learn from in, in s other STEM areas. Game-based learning has, has sort of, I, I don't know if, if the, maybe the jury is still out on how much students learn, 
But there has been some fair amount of work on this idea of stealth assessments in learning, especially around fairly complex concepts in physics and, yeah, and, and math and such. And so, you know, I, th I think uh, lots of opportunities even in the CS ed space to sort of look at some interesting ways of assessing that are motivating as well. Hey, uh, Nigaman Sri, the Cleveland State. Um, I was speaking of stealth assessments, I, I had um, uh, one teacher in our in our cohort last um, year, um, or this 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 school year, that um, that had e each of their students write an email to their parents every week, saying, "This is what I learned in computer science class," and um, you know it was it was just it was it was. He started it off as I mean he didn't realize what he was doing. He was basically trying to get them to write, right? And um, and and sure enough, over the course of um, of a six month by the by the by mid year, he could see what the you know first of all their writing levels were improving, right? Started off as as three or four words, and then you know it gets to um, uh, gets to full paragraphs and things like that. Um, and then you know at mid year he then turns around and shares with the students this is what you've written over the course over the course of the last four or five months, right? And that becomes this motivational piece for them to now get better at, at doing that. So, so you know, I, I'm, I'm just pointing that out as an example of, uh, of a stealth assessment that we're not going to, you know, share with all of our teachers and, and turn around and use that. Hi, Marie Bienkowski from SRI International. I work with Shuchi. Um, there's a couple things I wanted to say as follow-on and then one question. One is that regarding the issue of item banks, uh, we have a NSF DRK12 uh, research study that's looking at how um, teaching uh, implementation of exploring computer science affects student learning. And the assessments that we've developed are um, what we're using as measures in that research. But as part of that, we have a supplement to develop an item bank. So if people are interested, it's primarily high school at this point. If people are interested in learning about that or contributing to that, they should talk to me. Um, the second thing is that a lot of the examples, this is a question for the panel, a lot of the examples I heard seem to um, rely on programming knowledge. And I think that um, as a community, we haven't perhaps done a lot or enough to operationalize other constructs in computer science like abstraction or Shuchi mentioned problem solving. And I'm wondering uh, whether, how you feel about the relative importance or the relative amount of work we've done related to programming knowledge versus uh, computer science knowledge, these more abstract concepts. So, uh, well, I can talk about our exploring computer science <laughs> assessments, which actually are drawn uh, based on the curriculum itself. So, unit two of ECS, it's, it's across, um, well, across the four core units, they learn about impact of computing, they learn about problem solving, they learn web design and then programming. So the, that suite of assessments has operationalized all these aspects and there are, it's, it's a very good set of assessments right there. In terms of, uh, and I'm, I, I'll leave the AP folks, APCSP folks to talk about how they've talked about the big ideas and other things besides programming. At the middle school or at the younger grades, actually, if you look around, most of the curricula so far are focusing on programming. And, and that may be a bit of a problem, uh, and we want to sort of expand it. And in fact, in some of our work with variables, expressions, loops, and abstraction, we are in fact focusing on non-programming versions or, or activities that get kids thinking about those ideas and sort of connecting a lot of it to real world ideas and, and how these aspects sort of can um, can be seen in the world around them, not just in programming. And then of course we do make those linkages so that they can take those ideas and use them in Scratch and, and things like that. So I, I, I do agree, uh, I think a lot more could be done, um, but at the younger grades a lot of it is focused on coding. Uh, <coughs> I'm Maren Sami from Stanford University. Um, so one of the pieces of feedback we get a lot of times from industry is about the authenticity of assessments. 
where they say, you know, students have gone through these progressions, there's been a lot of assessments that have looked at these particular, you know, kind of problems, Parsons problems, or writing a bit of code. And that's not at all what students do when they actually get out into the workforce. And in many cases, the you know, feedback they give us is the students are not ready because the assessments that they're given are not authentic, so they don't have a sense of what they can really do. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that, how you balance between thinking about the formative assessments for the instructor to improve your instruction, the summative assessments to see how students are doing, but think about that in a context where it's supposed to be matching what students are eventually be able to do with this. I happen to be married to a programmer who programs from Northrop Grumman, so um, every day I come home and I hear what he does at his job, and I, to be honest, I have changed a lot what I do in my classroom based upon the skills that he, you know, has to have. Um, I also work really closely with the colleges, so I work really closely with Montana State University. Um, Montana doesn't like a bunch of industry coming into our state, but they love programming companies. So we have Oracles there, WorkEva, Northrop Grumman, um, all kinds of programming companies there. So um, they work with the companies, like MSU works with the companies themselves, and then I work with the universities to try to make sure that we are teaching what the skills they need to have. I think it's, it goes back to a feedback loop. I don't know if so far, for example, you uh, at, at Stanford or at, univers at the university level, you probably hear this from industry because that's where the students are headed out from you know, colleges to industry. So if there was this feedback loop, say from colleges back to high school and from high school down to, we're still in the process of creating all this assessment frameworks, the CS, you know, curriculum framework, it's all so new. So I think this feedback loop probably to feed back into what we ought to be assessing is, is I think, it's a very good point. It is a very good question. And, and I think the whole point of, of including things like creativity and collaboration into our curricular frameworks is so that, you know, because that's what they sort of, those are skills for the future. Though that's when, when they're using computing, they're also collaborating with people, but we don't often assess those things. And it goes back to this idea of assessment being a normative enterprise. If it is important, it should be assessed. And if you don't assess it, then it's a signal to the teachers, it's a signal to the students, oh, I can do this willy-nilly and it's all right. But if it's measured and you get feedback on whether you're doing it well or not doing it well, or, telling, or, or teaching teachers on how to foster those, those skills better or things like that. So I think, I, I think there, is, there is work to be done. And I think the feedback loop is important. We don't assess everything. Going, going back to Marie's point, a lot of it right now is focused on programming. Not so much on, on say, you know, how, how to work collaboratively as a team on a programming project, which is what a lot of people do out Hi. in the world. So I'm um, Krishna from Tinker. We, um, you know, we provide, uh, you know, online platform for kids to learn coding. We've worked uh, for three and a half, four years on these assessments. I think, I, I think programming computer science actually lends itself to automatic assessment. I'll give you some examples. You know, for example, you could uh, sandbox uh, some experiences where you let uh, kids figure it out themselves, like they fail a few times. So if you keep observing, if the system keeps observing, you can find out if they understand certain concepts or not. Um, and I think Suchi's point, or uh, rest of the, t you are sh you can also do you know kind of assessments from outside in perspective. For example, if you want to assess whether a student knows how to do animation, let's say, uh, you could do like you could design a few machine learning models, actually. You, if you feed in, these are the 100 projects that do uh, um, uh, animations properly. And if you feed in a student's project, it'll actually will be able to tell you if actually that those kind of concepts are used or not. I think the CS, in general, lends itself very well to a lot of automation. Uh, and we've actually worked with Apple this summer to design two courses that has built-in assessment about these abstract concepts like you know, like, you know, abstraction, debugging, and things like that. It's, and if, if you can expose that data back to the teachers in the classroom, where they can use the system's knowledge to kind of do other collaboration, other, other intangible things, it might be a much better way to address that problem. Do what? 
One more, qu one more quick question, and then we, I have one more quick question for the panel. I wanted to say something more about what Christian said about assessment and the type of assessments we keep talking about are more um, with question banks, and but those are not assessments that help students learn how to become better learners because whatever programming language they're learning in a CS class, it's going to change and not be necessarily the same one they're going to need when they finish. So I want to talk about how, what type of assessments that we have to help them um, look at their metacognition and their b ability to reflect and their ability to um, ass build their knowledge of learning and how they can continue to learn CS in other ways so that they feel empowered in that way? That's a good question. I don't see, I guess I don't see, I couldn't teach computer science without teaching the computational thinking. I, d I don't see them as two separate things. Um, so I guess maybe in, in my classroom, they build on what they learn the first day and they continue to build on it up until they leave my classroom. And if they aren't learning all along the way and being able to use what they learned later on, then that's, I've done my job poorly because they should be able to, if they learned a loop the first day, they should be able to use that the last day and know exactly what they're doing with it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to repeat for the video because it's, that wasn't in microphone. But it's harder to automate measures of, of how students are becoming learners rather than as opposed to what they learn. That's a really good point. We have two minutes, so I'm going to I'm going to cut off the conversation. But I encourage you to come up and talk to the panelists because it's a fabulous question and challenge. I have one last question. I wanted I asked everybody to just say um, something at the end. I think kind of we come in and we get all this information, and sometimes it's nice to hear from the panelists. What's the one most important thing we want? you to remember when you walk out the door and go to lunch, so. Assessment is not evil and it can help you do your job. <laughs> um, you cannot improve what you don't measure, but you have to measure what matters. And that all of you are fabulous because I'm actually teaching in the high school and it is just absolutely outstanding to see all of you people putting in this much work to try to help. And my final thought is, again, what I said in the beginning, that I see assessment as a tool for equity and inclusion, and I really hope we can shift the dialogue about assessment. And thank you to thank our you. amazing Thank you. Can we hand to the panel? Thank you guys very much. Thank you.